have your amazing book, What Happened to You, that you and Oprah have written together. Why is it so important to ask the question to people of what, of what happened to you? Well, I, I'm, I'm actually, um, by temperament, like an historian. I've always loved history. I've loved to read about history of all sorts. And uh, when you read history, what you realize is that if you want to understand the present, you need to know what happened before the present time. So if you want to understand the Middle East, you need to read about the history of the founding of the state of Israel. You need to read about other aspects of, you know, what happened at the Balfour Declaration. You need to understand what happened during World War I with the, the Ottoman Empire. You know, you need to understand how all of these things happened to get to the present. And then it makes more sense. Um, you know, and, and so when, if you're a historian, it's the same way you look at Northern Ireland, you know, you understand the Northern Ireland politics right now based upon the troubles. You understand the, you know, what's going on in Australia based upon the history of different groups that came to Australia and so forth. And it's the same way with a person that your personal history of relationships, your personal history of moving, your personal history of successes in school or failures in school or good relationships, bad relationships, all of that stuff mixes together to kind of make you who you are in the present. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, once you get to, you know, a lot of times we'll see people and we'll meet them or we'll, we'll see a troubling behavior or characteristic of that individual and it'll drive us crazy you know like why do they always do that you know what, what's wrong with them you know? yes. what's <laughs> so wrong with they... them that is a yeah, phrase yeah. that i've used many times <laughs> exactly why do they always date people like that yeah. you know and it's like this is one of the smartest people i know but they always yeah. get in relationships with jerks how does yeah. that happen well, why do they and always say you... that to me? They know that annoys me. Why do they keep doing it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so what the, if you knew the person's personal story, their, yeah. their history, you would have more insight into why they were attracted to that kind of person or why they had a hard time being setting boundaries and being firm or why they had a hard time, you know, why they're a close talker, you know, all the things that yeah, drive you nuts, yeah. you can kind of get an understanding of where they come from. And so the reason I think it's important to ask that question is it really means that you start your interaction with somebody really from a stance of curiosity rather than from a stance of judgment. And, and I think that that always leads to just getting to know somebody better. You just mentioned then, and you say in your book, what happened to you, that life experiences influence who you are and those experiences change the biology of your body and your brain. There's a um, bit in your book that I'd like to read out. It's a bit that Oprah has, has written. The long-term impact of being whipped, then forced to hush and even smile about it, turned me into a world-class people pleaser for most of my life. It would not have taken me half a lifetime to learn to set boundaries and say no with confidence had I had been nurtured differently. As an adult, I am grateful to enjoy long-term, consistent, loving relationships with many people, yet the early beatings, emotion, emotional fractures and splintered connections that I experienced with the central figures in my life no doubt helped develop my solitary independence. In the powerful words of the poem Invictus, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Millions of people were treated just as I was as children and grew up believing their lives were of no value. Why do people, what, I suppose my question is, people that come from horrendous upbringings, and I mean, you know, Oprah's upbringing was, is just, was awful. And you see how much she's achieved now, which is, you know, unbelievable and gives hope to so many people. Firstly, what happens when children have that sort of trauma and then how do you end up being like Oprah and able to achieve so much? So it's not like you have that and then it's like, sorry, you're written off. The rest of your life will be terrible. There is, there is hope. Yeah. 
there, there is, you know, the thing that's striking about working with kids and adults who've had really horrific backgrounds is how often they're healthier than you would have anticipated. Yeah. You know, how often they're still able to be a kind or still open to learning or still willing to try to form a relationship. And I, you know, I think in Oprah's case, and she'll talk about this really explicitly that for her, it was, there were non-family adults, teachers primarily, who saw her and, and, and gave her uh, a sense that she was special, that she mm -hmm. was bright, that she was good, that she was capable. And, and, and she writes about this in the book, her church community was part of that, but the school community was probably the most important part. Yeah. And uh, I think that that's our, in all of our research, what we find is that the people who are connected to family, community, or culture uh, have the ability to buffer stressors. So you can have all kinds of really terrible things happen, but if there are people around you who make you feel loved, who you feel connected with, uh, that can help counterbalance some of the negative things. And so <clears throat> we obviously we have a lot more to learn about this, but one of the key ingredients of sort of uh, getting through all of this stuff is um, having a healthy relationship with somebody who sees you as a special person. You know, they think that you're, they love you. Uh, they try to be present and supportive in the ways that they can. And that it's, it's amazing how powerful that is. Yeah. From everything that you've seen, and I know that you've been involved in so many studies with children firsthand from your work, you know, you've, you've, come into the lives of so many people who have struggled. How important is love? Well, I, I think it's, I think love is, it's all, love is everything. I yeah. mean, it, it really is what uh, makes our species capable of surviving. Um, human beings in the natural world, naked, slow, weak, no natural body armor, no special poison darts or anything. To, we're, we're basically meat on feet. <laughs> and the, the only reason we survived is that we were able to form loving bonds with other members of our species yeah. and create uh, a, a stronger, more functional, more flexible whole, which is the clan, the group. And this allowed us to, to basically survive in the natural world. And then ultimately it allowed us to start to take advantage of this remarkable, and it was probably some weird genetic mutation, but we have this remarkable capacity in our cortex to absorb more bits of information per second than any other species. Mm. We can absorb it and we can store it. And so what happens is, we now live in the present time with the accumulated distilled experiences of thousands of previous generations that have been passed forward to us. And, and that's, that's allowed us to be able to have a conversation across the globe in yeah. real time. I mean, all of this is an invention. Both our language is an invention. The technologies are inventions. And that's all because of this incredible capacity to create community and in community to create a sense of safety where people were able to have their cortex open for business. Because when you're under threat, you, your cortex shuts down. So clan, family, connectedness, belonging makes you feel safe, which opens up your cortex, which means that you can learn and store things and then process them in abstract ways and invent new things. And every generation just get a little bit smarter, a little bit better, a little bit more creative. And that's what's, that's the history of humanity. And it's all based on the capacity to form and maintain loving relationships. Oh, that's so beautiful. If you put fear and love next to each other, would love always override fear? You know, fear is powerful. 
<clears throat> and fear has been used across the generations to manipulate and influence groups of people. And uh, in the, you know, I, I, I believe love always wins in the end. So do I. But it, it doesn't always win in every individual's life, right? Yeah. I mean, there are individuals who uh, has, uh, get in situations where fear and terror and pain and horrific things happen. But I think collectively that the human species, the human as a group, even though there may be instances and periods where there's fear and hate and death that impact members of our group, ultimately the, our capacity to be loving is gonna uh, overcome that and outweigh that. But we've certainly had incredibly brutal periods in the history of humanity. Yeah. Um, and, but I, again, I'm, you know, if you sort of take us as a group, I, I do think that love is ultimately gonna win.